Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with this evening's webinar. As I said, my name is Aaron Sumrall, and uh, we'll be going through the, the webinar tonight with you. Uh, joining me tonight with uh, the webinar is uh, Marshall Locker, trap support for Pig Brig, and uh, he's going to be the one when you call into Pig Brig and you hit option two, that's where you're going to, is you're you're talking to Marshall. Uh, also there that's, uh, that's, that's joining us tonight are a few of the other Pig Brig family, and, and uh, we've got uh, Kayla is um, is with us. She'll be a little bit more visible for you next month, and uh, she is absolutely new to the team. She joined us just a couple of weeks ago, and glad to have her. Uh, also joining us tonight is is uh, Brooke. Uh, Brooke is the one that absolutely is the king of webinars. She's the one that puts everything together for us, and and uh, and she is under Vicky one there on your screen, and then uh, below that with Vicky two is Margaret. Margaret is the the director, the head of our customer support that is just so impeccable that uh, regardless of what the issue that we have, we we try to make sure that we take care of it quickly. Uh, also joining us tonight is Alex. That he he is uh, uh, in in conjunction with Brooke with regard to Mark and outreach and making sure that we understand what uh, you're you're giving us back and feedback and um, uh, the last one on there that's joining us tonight and definitely not least is Amanda and Amanda is um, the the head of our operations and making sure that you get your brigs uh, quickly after you order them and making sure the logistics flows accordingly so uh, with that we got everyone starting to slow down on the number of entries that are coming into the to the uh, event tonight. What we want to do is the way we start all the events each month, if you're new to uh, these webinars, is we want to make sure that you understand how to use the chat or the Q&A fe feature um, on your, your computer. So that's the way we'll communicate with you tonight uh, with questions and answers or any kind of comments that you may have or anything like that. So we want to make sure that you understand how to use that. So uh, tonight, the question that we have for you to answer to, to, to know how to use that Q&A is what I want to know is two two questions the first question is what is the largest catch number that you've had in a trap regardless of the technology it doesn't have to be a brig but what is the largest number of pigs you've caught in a trap the second question is i want to know what is the largest individual what's the heaviest individual that you've caught in a trap so two questions the largest number, largest individual. So I see some numbers coming in, some, some people responding, uh, so we can make sure that that Q&A works accordingly. Uh, so again, largest number of, of individuals in a single catch, largest individual in a catch. Good, I see a lot of numbers that are coming in. So keep coming with those numbers and uh, and and, um, obviously, we want to make this as interactive as we possibly can, but what we're going to do at this point is we're going to move forward with uh, tonight's webinar and uh, and discuss a few things there. Before we get into that, we want to, to, to make sure that you're aware of the events that are coming up for the remainder of the year. Uh, we've just literally started the new programming year, the new webinar year, just a little bit back, and uh, these are the events that we'll have coming up uh, throughout the rest of the year. So uh, next month on April... The event in April, we're just going to be on the 27th of the month, and uh, and all of them start at the same time at 7 p.m. Central, with the exception of November and December, obviously because of Christmas and and uh, Thanksgiving there. So we want to make sure that that you have the, the right times, the right places and to, to join us. If you can't, for whatever reason, join us for one of those webinars. Uh, all of them are being recorded, so uh, you can share them with your friends. You can go back and watch them, or if you missed it, you can catch it later. Uh, but obviously, the uh, we want to make sure that you have the information at hand um, as we're moving forward. So with that, tonight, what we're going to be talking about is uh, is is spring green up and, and what that means for pigs and pig management for you as managers uh, of the landscape and what we need to keep in mind with regard to the spring of the year. Because what we need to think about in there is spring for the focal points is for me and a lot of others that that are in the in the game day to day is spring can be the toughest time of year to trap it's just one of those those situations that you can find yourself beating your head against the proverbial pole with regard to pigs 
because it's just it's it's so much of a different uh, landscape than what we've seen in that late winter time of the year when there was just not really much out there for those pigs, making them really uh, responsive to bait and to your trap sites and so forth. Uh, right now, they're just an absolute overabundance of high quality nutrition uh, that we're competing with at those trap locations and trap sites. So that's something that we need to make sure that we keep in mind because as we think about that overabundance of, of high quality nutrition that they have not been uh, exposed to since the previous spring, it's going to be easy for us to educate pigs in the spring of the year. Whenever they're less responsive to bait sites and less responsive to uh, our efforts, um, then they really see an opportunity to, I guess, educate themselves as what's not normal to the environment, what's not normal to what they see day to day. So what we need to think about there is that it, if that's the case, if that's the possibility of you educating pigs because they have a lot of availability that they haven't had in a long time, do we use the spring of the year as an opportunity to main tra maintain traps and other gear and get your pig brig year planned from this point on? So that's some of the things that we'll talk about tonight and uh, and, and cover some of that in detail. and. What we want to do is that when we get to the end of this, this uh, presentation, we're going to open this up for you to put your questions into that chat or that Q&A feature. And after the presentation is over, the, the length of how long we're going to be here is going to be dictated by how many questions you have and making sure that we answer those questions appropriately uh, before we wrap up the night's event. So when we start thinking about more on spring challenges and how we need to navigate those challenges, we need to remember in the spring of the year that pigs are highly nomadic uh, just because of the natural green up. During the late fall, winter time of the year, many of the food sources that those pigs depend on are very, very uh, isolated and very specific. And they go from beds straight to the feeding locations because of the limited nutrition that's out there. There's not really much need for them to, to disperse themselves across the landscape looking for opportunistic feeding. In those late fall and winter time frames, much of that nutrition is located in a very specific and concise location, and they go straight from one point to the next without much uh, navigating across that landscape. So the other thing that we need to think about in the spring of the year is increased levels of human activity and gunfire. And what I mean by human activity is we finally have broken out from the doldrums of, of the winter at the winter cold and the chill and and that rainy atmosphere possibly and it gives us a chance to get out and enjoy nature again so just by nature of the season we're going to see increases in human activity other things obviously that we're going to see in the spring of the year is the increase in, in agriculture production it's going to be time to plant it's going to be time to get out there and work that ground and and do what we need to do in agriculture and pigs didn't draw the correlation very quickly or very easily between us out there trying to manage and remove those pigs off the landscape and just you out there in a planter moving a tractor across the land they just see it as human activity the thing that we need to keep in mind with regard to gunfire in the spring of the year is is a very uh, common and very, um, I guess, um, practice that makes a lot of sense in the spring of the year is we don't see a lot of response from time to time with with regard to pigs at trap sites. So a lot of the land managers will go to that point of laying that trap down and not using that as a tool, and they'll pick up the gun uh, to try to keep those animals pushed back, those pigs pushed back off of agriculture fields or whatnot whenever they're less responsive to uh, bait leverage at a trap site. So we need to kind of keep those things in mind that just by nature of the time of the year, those things are going to happen, and that's going to also result in a negative response to trapping efficiencies and effectiveness uh, because of what we do just as in nature. Um, then again, to the increase in risk availability. And whenever I talk about resource availability, what we're talking about specifically is in terms of food and just food goes out the, 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 the sky. I mean, it's just astronomical increases in food availability. Um, one of the things that comes to mind first and foremost for me is that those winter forbs that we see starting to sprout in the fall of the year, uh, when it, it may be a food plot that we planted for deer, it could be a number of different things that are out there is as those, those, winter forbs continue to mature throughout the winter, they get to that point in the spring. And many times that's a lot of highly valuable and nutritious food sources that they can take uh, full advantage of, which 
is going to do a lot of things for those animals, especially if it's a lactating female or a female that's really late in her gestational period. She's in a, in a position where she has to uh, attain the highest level of food availability and nutritional content to make sure that she, one, that she uh, completes that gestational cycle appropriately. And then number two is that if she's lactating, that she gives those piglets the highest level of, of milk quality that she can. So that's always the, the, the driving focus and the force of what pigs are trying to do in the spring of the year with regard to the female. Um, obviously, again, we've already mentioned that we've got agriculture planting season. And many times those ag guys that are planting crops, they're waiting on who the first person is to put a plow in the ground or to put a planter in the ground because typically they know whoever's the first to plant is going to be the first to see damage. So they're not the ones that typically want to go out there and have to, to go back and redo something they've already done whenever it's expensive is what it is to put those crops in the ground. So Next thing typically spring means for most of us is that we're going to see increased rainfall. Uh, if it's places that we've seen uh, high, high levels of snow or ice or whatnot, obviously those melting uh, snow and ice uh, accumulations are going to cause soft ground. Whenever that soft ground occurs, one thing is going to happen is that it's going to make it easier for those pigs to get in the ground. But number two is if that ground gets to a saturation point, those invertebrates can't be deep in the soil profile or they'll drown. So with saturated soils and wet soils, it's going to force those invertebrates closer to the surface of the ground, making it easier for that pig to be able to access that extremely nutritious food source that they haven't had uh, the opportunity to exploit for pretty much since last spring. So the other thing about the food availability in the spring is now we see the, the downturn of the abundance of mature winter forbs, but we see an extremely quick escalation in the spring or summer annual warm season forbs that pigs are going to take advantage of throughout the landscape. And for those of us that, that, that are in agriculture and know what we're talking about when we, we refer to forbs, um, for us, that's just a weed. But for the wildlife guys that are out there, that a forb is nothing but candy and ice cream for the wildlife out there. Uh, the agriculture, not so much. We're trying to get rid of them. But pigs are going to be there to take advantage of that resource, regardless if it's spring or a winter forb. It's just super highly nutritious. Biggest thing in the spring of the year for me is just to be patient. Uh, we need to be patient throughout the trapping process, regardless of the season. But spring is probably, for me, the most important uh, season of the year to remain patient because it is the easiest time of the year to educate pigs. Because if they have plenty of nutrition, they have plenty of resources that are out there, basically we look at the nutritional qualities of, of our standard bait. Whenever I talk about a standard bait, I'm just talking about dry corn or maybe a fermented corn. Uh, the, the nutritional qualities of that, that corn-based bait is not very good. It's just basically a maintenance diet. Yeah, it puts fat on an animal and it can do certain things for them, but it is nowhere nearly as highly sought after as something with the, a, a food source that may be in the, in the upper teens to even low 30 uh, protein content and so forth. So whenever we look at that, that fact, we're probably going to lose bait leverage to some degree in the spring of the year um, with regard to using your standard corn-based bait. So if you're going to use that, stay patient. Make sure that you don't push pigs. So be aware of your activity. So if pigs are not responding, that doesn't mean that we need to check this trap locations in the morning and in the evening every day until they respond because those pigs are still in that area. They hear you. They possibly see you. And that increased activity is going to even further push them away from those trap sites. So we need to make sure that we're not forcing pigs. And moving down to that third bullet, we don't want to force pigs to cooperate because they are a highly intelligent individual. Uh, so if the more you force them, the more that we're going to educate that animal. So they are extremely responsive to human activity, uh, regardless if it's an if it's active management toward them or if it's just incidental uh, movement across the landscape. They don't differentiate between the two. So we need to be cognizant of what we do with human activity and don't force those pigs into places they don't want to be or you're going to educate them and push them further back. So with that being known, we need to make sure that we focus on our photos. Uh, I mean, it, all of us know that a pig brig family, we don't need a camera at the trap site to catch a pig. That's something that's the beauty of that trap system is that it's super uh, passive. We can set the trap and basically set it, forget it, show up tomorrow morning, get your pigs out. But 
a, a, a camera is an excellent addition to a trap site to be your eyes and ears when you can't be there or you don't need to be there. So we need to focus on the photos in the spring of the year and, and take that different approach to, to being in the area. So if you go out and you heavily uh, condition a bait site, uh, if there's no need to be uh, back at that bait site daily. Uh, as long as you have a camera there to monitor that that bait site, let those animals move the way that they typically would move without any uh, pressure coming from your your activity. Uh, now, this comes to the next point where we talk about pig management being something that's adaptive. Whenever we we, we compare uh, wildlife management to agriculture management in the agriculture world, we refer to it as integrated pest management. And the reason it's integrated is we can specifically put it on a calendar by the date. We don't really have to worry about uh, too much more other than this is the right time of the year uh, and this is when we do things. Where in comparison with wildlife, we need to read the conditions. Uh, wildlife management, including pigs, needs to be adaptive. So we need to adapt our management to the time of the year and the conditions that we're seeing on the field with and, and, and also throwing in that factor of the um, activity of the animal, what kind of damage they're showing, what kind of uh, behaviors they're, they're exposing to us. So now is this time that we may need to incorporate uh, other legal options into your pig management in the spring of the year. And what I mean by other legal options, no matter the research you read, trapping is the foundation that is most soundly uh, affiliated with pig management. So that's the foundation that you approach is, is pig management needs to be based on trapping and then incorporate the other legal options in as appropriate. So if we've trapped those animals from fall of the year all the way through the winter and now we're into the spring of the year where pigs are less responsive to what we're trying to do this may be the time of year that we go out there and we use our our hunting dogs to remove the other stragglers that we weren't able to catch uh, it's very well known that we use traps to remove the large numbers and and dog effectiveness as far as hunting dogs gets astronomically better whenever there's a smaller number to manage. So we can take that sounder of 30 down to only six or eight remaining individuals. And then, and then once you release your dogs on those remaining six or eight individuals, they're much, much more effective in, in removing that entire sounder uh, or that local population. Uh, other things that's better used in the spring of the year than maybe other comparable seasons is uh, strategic shooting. And I'm not talking about just going out there with the old deer rifle and riding around in the side by side and shooting whatever shows up. What I'm referring to is that whenever we look at agriculture production, many of those sounders start to congregate on those agriculture fields. And you see the formations of super sounders in the spring of the year because the super high abundance of, of uh, a food source in a very localized area. Those competing sounders over the course of the year, we'll get to the point where they're more tolerant of one another in the spring of the year, just because of the overabundance of food. So if you find yourself in that situation and they're not responding to bait or the ground may be too wet where you can't get out there to do something uh, the way that you want to do that, a, an excellent way to keep those animals pushed back to give those crops a chance to perform is with uh, your thermal technologies, your strategic shootings, because it has been found in the research that in with small sounders, with strategic shooting and in, in, in advanced gear that you can remove a complete sounder if they're a small sounder to keep them back off of that agriculture field. So spring of the year may be an excellent time for you to incorporate strategic shooting uh, where traps may lose their effectiveness because of the loss of bait leverage. Um, other things that are out there, again, snaring, if that's something you want to try to incorporate, just keep in mind about the snaring is that Obviously, your deer, your livestock, your dogs, things of that nature are going to use the same trails as a pig. So whenever we think about snaring pigs, uh, we think about how they hold their head and the way that they move down those trails as comparable to, to, to deer. Whenever you see a deer moving through the landscape, they keep their head above ground pretty high. Uh, but whenever pigs move, typically their head is a lot closer to the ground. So if you're going to be using snares, think about positioning those snares with that open loop a little closer to the ground. And uh, that way, if a deer does happen to use that uh, that same trail, it yeah, you may uh, have a 
have a, a, a negative set because a deer may hit it with its legs and knock that, that snare down, but it's a lot better than setting that snare high where we end up catching that deer that's using the same trail. So keep some of those things in mind whenever we think about incorporating our other strategies in there. But the main thing, one that we need to address before we leave this, this slide is that there are no legal home remedies, folks. Uh, I do a lot of programming and a lot of education all over uh, the country and, and places around the world. And sometimes I get to places and I hear people say, well, I found out a strategy to get rid of them and this is what it is. And typically it, regard, it, 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 it goes and gravitates around to somebody doing something out of their garage or out of the barn or something like that. Folks, that's, that's something we need to leave in the garage and, and not think about taking on those home remedies uh, because of the, the obvious fallout that can come from that not just toward pigs, but to other wildlife and, and uh, livestock and pets. So uh, keep, the, keep the home remedies at the home and not use them as a remedy. So the other things about this in the spring of the year is, is if, if they're not giving you bait leverage and you're not seeing the response that you need at the spring to, uh, to be able to hi be highly effective, this may be the perfect time of the year to go in there and say, you know what, I'm going to give those pigs just a little bit of a break. I may roll my efforts back just a little bit, but I'm going to use this time of the year to maintain my gear. So we need to go in there and check your nets. Go ahead and if you haven't cleaned them all year long, uh, go ahead and clean them. But remember, if you're cleaning nets, don't use any detergents or anything like that that could break down that UV coating. Just a simple garden hose with some clean water over it and allow that net to dry accordingly is about all you need whenever it comes to cleaning your gear or cleaning your nets. Uh, check your, your anchor stakes and your ground anchors and things of that nature to make sure that they're in appropriate working order, that, that if you need to replace anything, get that ordered and make sure that you, you have it on the way for when the next season rolls around. Another thing we need to think about in this, this spring of the year that that if we're going to take that little bit of a, a break is identify new areas where you can place your post or identify sets that you could use the trees um, and, and get that plan in place for next next uh, the next season. And that's going to be the foundation of the uh, the. Um, let me get my month straight. The April webinar is going to be prepping and planning your, your, your pig brig year. So something that we need to think about in the spring of the year is that if it's not, the pigs are not responding the way that you would like them to do now may be the perfect opportunity with softer ground that if you know where your, your future sets are going to be, go ahead and go drive those posts where you know that you're going to be trapping pigs in the future. Or if it's going to be a tree set, go ahead and make sure that the branches are out of the way that you can set that trap up a lot quicker whenever those conditions change in your favor. Um, other things to do is get out and talk to your landowners. Uh, if you had new landowners that may have moved in over the course of the, the, the fall and the winter, it's a good chance to go in there and talk to them about uh, what typically happens in your area or the landowners that are, have been there for years that may not be involved in pig management. Find out how the, those, those pigs are moving through their land and how they're moving through their operations and figure out what you may be able to do and, and moving forward with your pig management. One of the things we need to keep in mind, though, is making sure that we're aware of what those those neighboring are to be high gunfire at certain times of the year. Uh, then we make sure we don't set traps along fence lines if it's going to be high uh, uh, gunfire in the spring of the year. But on the flip side, if the spring of the year is when they're not going to be out there shooting guns and high, high amounts of, of human activity, that may be the exact time of the year that we want to we want to focus on those peripheral boundaries of a property uh, with management and then move closer to the center of that property whenever their activity increases and forces those pigs closer to your center. Uh, the last thing that we want to think about here in this slide anyway is using your sham. And what we're talking about and what we, with regard to using your sham is, is I get asked many times at different places is, do I need a pig brig for every single location around my property or I may manage multiple properties? Do I need the same net to do everything? And, and the more is better, I guess, if you want to see it that way. But if you've got a place that you have three locations set up or you know that you're going to need to trap pigs in three locations, can you cover those three locations with one net? Yes, you can. And what we do to say highly effective in those three locations with one net is we use what we refer to as a sham net. And, uh, and basically a sham net is just what the name implies. It's a fake. Uh, it's not the true net. But what we do is once your T-posts are in place, or you have a, uh, a tree set identified, we'll take 
uh, uh, empty like black trash bags and we'll zip tie those those black trash bags to your t-post if you got a 10 t-post set with your pig brig we only need to attach those black trash bags to three or four of those posts within that set or in that location and what's going to happen is that that uh, inclusion of trash bags at that set is going to desensitize those pigs to that environment as they come in and continue to feed on your conditioning efforts there, they're going to get acclimated to the movements and to the sounds. And now with every trash bag out there being scented, they're going to be uh, acclimated to the scent of something new in the environment. So the more they want that food, the more they want to respond to that bait, they're going to get acclimated to that extra movement, sound, smells, everything else. So whenever you identify that place is ready to go to catch your pigs, you just simply move your net in and immediately go into catching those pigs with very, very little additional conditioning. So, but if you're using shams into a location to catch pigs, don't take those sham nets down. So whenever we leave those sham nets in place, we want to make sure that whenever we initially put those shams up, we know that our, our T-post brackets are going to be at a five foot height on that T-post. So whenever you attach your shams, if you're going to use a trash bag or something of the similar, we want to attach those trash bags down low enough on that post where we can still attach that T-post bracket above that sham net where we can keep those shams in place whenever we hang that net. That's just going to make it that much more uh, familiar to the site that those pigs have got acclimated to. But those sham nets will allow you to condition multiple sites, moving a single net between two, three, four different locations. So uh, that's something that's worked extremely well, regardless of where we've where we've uh, employed it, if it's in the States or somewhere else around the world. So other things about baiting in the spring of the year, if you have been a, 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 a participant in more than two uh, webinars in the past, the first bullet on that 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 slide right there is my soapbox, folks. Uh, I I am definitely not a supporter in using diesel to bait pigs, um, and and that's something that we need to keep in mind. Not with the 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 practice of baiting pigs as a primary focus, but the reason I definitely do not like uh, using diesel is one, there's better options, and number two, diesel is a soil contaminant, and and in and getting into a water source, it could be a water uh, contaminant as well. So. Uh, with better options and the environmental concerns surrounding diesel, I will never be a supporter or endorse or encourage the use of diesel ever at a trap site uh, for pig purposes. So leave the diesel in the cans or keep it in the tractor, but but don't put it on the ground for pigs. Um, make sure that you're you're monitoring uh, the photos and seeing what the photos are telling you, what's going on with the surroundings. One of the things I look at to tell me a little bit about what pigs are doing in the spring of the year is that if I'm seeing uh, sporadic damage or sporadic rooting across the landscape uh, as comparable to what we typically see in a total uh, damage of the land, what that sporadic damage is telling me on a landscape is that those pigs haven't really found what they're looking for in a food source or they found everything they want to above ground and they don't need to root the ground up. Uh, pigs are lazy. OK, that's uh, we, we, we definitely see pigs lounging a lot of times. So the last thing a pig wants to do is root the ground up if there's sufficient food sources above ground level. So if you're seeing incidental or, 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 or random um, uh, damage to the surface of the ground, it's probably because they're finding everything that they need to above ground and there's no need to go in the ground. And if that's the case, you see very minimal damage to the ground, that's probably giving you a pretty good indicator that your bait leverage, if you're using corn or whatnot, is going to be met with minimal acceptance because they're already fat and happy and getting everything they want to with very little effort. So in that situation, though, in the spring of the year, with increased rainfall, soft ground, new water in places that we may not have seen for a while, one of the things that we are going to see an increase on is uh, external parasites. We may see uh, increases in ticks, fleas, lice, things like that on those pigs. So what I do whenever I'm thinking about baiting pigs in the spring of the year, I'm thinking about possibly using oil rubs. And, uh, and I can put a picture up if y'all think it's worth it uh, on the Facebook owners group following this meeting. But one of the things I use whenever with regard to an oil rub is, is take a, your standard corner post uh, that you may have in a fence line or whatnot and wrap a, a rug around it, uh, old carpet, something of that nature. But instead of having that, that, that uh, post standing upright, I lay the post on the ground. Wrap that carpet or that rug around that post that's laying on the ground and attach it with staples or 
nails or whatever you need to to attach it to that that post. And then what I do is instead of using burnt motor oil, I will use fish grease or fry grease or something that's cooked shrimp or something like that and, and pour that over the rug on that post and use that for a rub. So what's going to happen is that that pigs are going to, to, one, the smell of that fish, fry grease, seafood grease, whatever, is going to be an attractant that they're going to come in just out of curiosity to check out what's going on there. But we know that based on, I mean, you can do a highway study and look at the highway assessments and see the number of uh, electrical poles along the highway that have been rubbed by pigs. What they're looking for is the creosote in those pit, in those posts to use as a, a as an insecticide for external parasites. So basically, what I do is I take that same situation or scenario, and instead of having the post standing upright, I lay the post on the ground and cover it with that type of a, a grease or an oil that's been used for food preparations and so forth. And then those pigs come in based on the smell attracting, uh, and then they use it as a as an external parasite uh, remover. And, and the reason I don't use burnt motor oil as often is one of the questions we ask you in, in, a, in, a, in a previous uh, webinar is how many of you use wild pigs as a food source? I'm going to tell you, every, everyone out there, if you go and open up my deep freeze and you find pork in there, there's about a 99% sure probability it's going to be wild. OK, so uh, what we think about with regard to using pigs as a food source is that it has been found that if you're using burnt motor oil or creosote or something like that, that as those pigs continue to rub on that that type of an oil, you'll find the residues in the meat tissue itself. So I personally don't feel like eating burnt motor oil. So I would much rather eat something that's had uh, fish, fries, shrimp, something like that in there heck of a lot safer and it actually um, is something I don't want to have to worry about uh, lubing up my insides if I'm eating something that's a, a burnt motor oil of, so, of sorts. So the thing, the last thing I want to talk about on this slide for you is, is that uh, many of you uh, may may like to use baits and or, or attractants and, and, uh, and, and getting leverage to bait sites where and if that's the way you want to do it, that's great. That's fine. And if it works for you, continue to use what's working. What I would suggest to you is moving into these warmer months of the year. What I've seen in the past, and this is something that's held true regardless of where I'm at, is the difference between gel attractants and powder attractants uh, according to season. Whenever we see the, warm, the, the ground starting to warm up, um, I see that whenever I've used gel attractants in the past, that ground starts to warm up. Uh, fire ants quickly come to the surface of the ground, and many times I've had trapping efforts spoiled by fire ants coming to gel-based attractants. So because of those observations over the years, if I'm using an attractant and it's a gel-based attractant, I concentrate that gel-based attractant on the cooler months of the year whenever those ants are further down into the ground to give me less interaction, less prob problems uh, from them coming to a, an attractant that's heavily water-based. So, and the further we get into the summertime, the more you'll see this possibility whenever water availability to those ants go down, anything that's got any moisture to it, they're gonna come too. So uh, just kind of keep some of that in mind. If you see fire ants on the ground around you or where you're at, you may wanna start leaning to the powder attractants in the summertime or those summer or those warmer months uh, because one, they're, they're water soluble. It's not gonna be anything that, that they're gonna give you uh, any additional water source for those, those ants to attract to, because basically if you're using a fermented bait that's going to absorb that water and that powder attractant, there's not going to be a, a, um, a lasting source of water that's on the ground like you'd find in those gel-based attractants. So something to kind of keep in mind, keep your gels for the winter, the, the cooler months or the winter months, use those powders during the spring of the year if you uh, select to use uh, attractants or additives or anything like that. Now, if you use attractants and additives, you need to be consistent in what you use. So whatever you start the baiting process with, it, with in that conditioning phase, you need to stay with that same uh, recipe throughout the whole catch phase as well, because it's much like uh, a recipe that we get accustomed to eating in our own lives. If somebody changes up that recipe at any time, we can pretty quickly uh, 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 disertain that it's been changed one way or another, and we may not like it at all and shy away from it. So same situation with pigs. If you change that recipe up through the process, you may push those pigs away. Uh, and then on the, on the flip side of that, 
if you start a baiting regimen that's not using baits and attractants, and then you try to incorporate that because pigs are not responding, you may further push those pigs away. So if pigs are not responding to a bait for whatever reason, before you start throwing everything but the kitchen sink uh, at those pigs to get them to respond, first we need to find out why they're not responding to what you're trying to do before we start trying to make amendments. So a few things around baiting and so forth and so on, but that's going to kind of wrap up for the slides that I had tonight. Uh, we try to make sure that we we don't waste your time and we keep this pretty concise and on time. But this is the last that we want to cover up there tonight. Obviously, we covered uh, green means go for pigs. Uh, the last few things or the, the, the next few things that are coming up there are listed on that, that uh, uh, list of webinars coming up. But if there's something specific that we need to cover uh, in a upcoming webinar, give us that question ahead of time and we'll make sure that we incorporate that into those slides and address that as it's going through. If there's something on or, or if there's something missing from that that list of webinars coming up that you want to see added, please definitely let us know and we can incorporate that in and make sure that there's a, a, a an event time for that, that we can address issues that you see uh, fit to be addressed. But with that, what we're going to do at this point, we're going to open this up to questions and answers. And Marshall's going to be here to help me out with these too, to um, the questions that you may have. I'm sitting here in Texas, uh, not far off the Louisiana border, actually maybe less than two miles off the Louisiana border. Uh, Marshall is in Southeast Georgia. And, uh, and we definitely see two different things based on what we see in those the, with regard to pigs. So um, if you have questions, now is the time to open them up. I know that the rest of the team is going to be there watching that chat box uh, to make sure that we do not miss the questions that you have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Marshall, if you've got anything while they're logging in questions to add to that, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and cover that now. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, um, but got a couple of questions for you already on a daily basis how many pounds of food does a mature pig eat well what we typically see now the in in whenever we talk about mature pigs about the only thing that we have as far as research backed is on the domestic side so you have to take some of that domestic information and extrapolate that to a wild side and what we see in, in regards to food intake is basically going to be built on a percentage basis. So percentage basis wise on the domestic pigs, we're looking at what we're trying to accomplish out of that animal. But it could be from anywhere one to two to three percent of their body weight. So we're looking at a, at a hundred pound pig. It may be that they need to have three pounds of, of food a day to make sure that they maintain what they have. Now, if we're trying to push that pig to be more productive and so forth, we may increase that all the way up to six or seven percent of a daily uh, of their body weight daily. Uh, so now with regard to pig to wild pigs to ferals. The thing that we need to keep in mind is that the food availability to ferals is extremely different than it is to domestics. Domestics don't have to worry about anything but when the food bucket drops in front of them. So nutrition for a wild pig is going to be highly cyclical. Certain times of the year, like the spring, is going to be unbelievable amounts of nutrition. But just the, a couple of months ago in the dead of the winter, they may not be anything out there. So pigs, wild pigs, are going to be extremely opportunistic where they may be uh, in a situation where they're trying to recover from hard winter time like now. They may eat as much as 10% of their body weight where in the winter time. Uh, they may not even have the availability in a day to only eat two or three percent of their body weight. So good question. It's just going to depend on the time of the year. And 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 wild pigs are going to be much more opportunistic than we would see in a domestic pig. Uh, what would you consider to be powder attractants um, and some examples? Yeah, for sure. Powder attractants, anything you're going to be able to tear the package off of and it comes out of a paper package. That's going to be your, your Kool-Aid powders, your Jell-O powders, your things like that. Uh, anything that you dump out and if you're in a strong wind, you're going to lose half of it downwind. Uh, so that's what I'm referring to as a, as a, as a powder. Uh, your grape Jell-Os, your grape Kool-Aids, your strawberries, things like that. Uh, there are a lot of commercially available powder attractants that's the same way. You uh, you tear the top off the bag and it's in a paper bag and you you pour it out, whereas opposed to your gel-based attractants, typically that's in a plastic jug or something of that nature. And uh, uh, you, 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 in powdered attractants, you typically ferment that 
powder detractant in with the bait itself. Whereas if you're using a gel based attractant, you literally pour it right over the top of the bait that you've you've just put on the ground for pigs. What else do we have? Any other questions? I'm not and seeing any. I mentioned earlier, and you kind of touched on this when you were talking about your oil rubs, but have you ever used fish carcasses for bait in the early spring? Yes, I, I, we definitely use fish carcasses. Uh, the one thing, obviously, that you're going to think about in the in the spring of the year or any time of the year with regard to fish carcasses is what else out there is going to eat fish carcasses. And I can promise you, if you've got any number of raccoons in the area, uh, get ready. You're, you're going to have a bunch of the bandits coming around your, your trap site with regard to fish carcasses. Um, if you don't have as many coons in the area, uh, it's it's an option there to use if you don't want to have worry, worry about deer in the spring. Uh, so it's something to kind of look at what your non-target species are and whether or not that's going to be uh, an option for you if it's just going to be more headache. But yeah, I've used, I've used fish carcasses. One of the things I've used if you don't have fish carcasses is go to the grocery store and get sardines directly off the shelf. And uh, and and that's going to be a different bait smell, a different uh, attracting ability there. But I can tell you, I've had times before where I've used just your standard bait and only have two or three uh, raccoons come into a trap site, and I incorporate uh, fish or fish uh, carcasses to that same site, and literally have twenty coons show up the first night. So think about your your non-targets. But and Marshall's probably got ex uh, uh, examples of the same situation. Not with fish, but uh, I have talked with a with a couple of people that use dead chickens. Um, the only yeah. problem you like Aaron said with the fish, um, anytime you use a carcass, you're gonna you're gonna encounter more non-targets, and you're gonna draw the predators and uh, your cleanup crew, like your buzzards, your uh, your eagles, and stuff like that, are gonna start looking at your your trap uh, as a food source. Yeah, one of the things there too about that, Marshall, on the on the predator um, uh, being attracted to that, it might not be a big issue if a coyote comes by there and snags a, a fish carcass and takes off and goes on about his own business. But if a coyote comes by there and before he uh, grabs that fish carcass, he decides he needs to urinate on your trap, then now we've got a, a, a deterrent there that if you've got a sow with young pigs, and she smells where that coyote's been there, even though that coyote does not pose a threat to her, she's going to move shop quickly because now there's a predator there that can that can feed on those little pigs. Have you um, guys ever used cow blood for bait? Cow blood? The only time that I've ever used blood, and I have used it, but it's in a blood meal. Uh, blood meal is something that's a heck of a lot more easy to, uh, to work with. It doesn't get all over you like you would with a standard blood. The other thing, the difference between blood and blood meal is if you don't use blood quickly uh, from another species, it ferments quickly and it stinks. So then you're going to run into that situation of attracting vultures and other things like that from that fermenting blood, whereas opposed if you're using blood meal, then then basically that blood meal is going to stay in a in a constant state for a much longer period of time before it starts to rot so gives you a little bit more leverage there but um but yeah blood and blood meal there's two different products two different ways to use them but if you're using blood you need to get on it and use it quick how many setup locations would you recommend for 500 acres and or what minimum distance would you suggest between set locations that's yeah, a very good question. This is something that we get posed to us almost daily. Um, the, the thing that I'm going to say is that that's going to depend on what that 500 acres has as far as resources. If it's going to be something that's going to be more of a pasture atmosphere, that's going to be more open ground, things like that, you might not need but one trap location to cover the whole 500 acres. Because we need to remember, basically, pigs have legs. They're going to go to wherever the food is. But if you flip the coin and that that 500 acres is more of a typical setting that we see in the southeastern United States where it might be a mixed pine hardwood stand with incremental open areas and whatnot, then I probably still don't need more than three trap locations in that area. And that's also going to depend on what my neighbors are doing. Because if my neighbors are not doing anything uh, to manage pigs, then I need to use the full expanse of that 500 acres to try to reduce the number even off of their land. Because even though it's off of their land, that's your problem as well. They're going to jump that fence and be all over you. So 
if I'm looking at 500 acres, I'm probably not going to look at more than three trap locations, even if it's of the best quality of, of habitat. Um, the other things I'm going to think about is, is where my water corridors are through there. If it's ponds or if it's flowing water, uh, that's going to have to a little bit of a factor in what I do. Um, other things that's going to be out there with regard to that 500 acres is I'm going to make sure that I stay consistent in all locations because you're going to have in 500 acres probably overlapping pigs or overlapping sounders. And that's going to be something that I'm going to keep in mind whenever I'm trapping uh, a bigger property is, is how do my pigs overlap? If I've got overlapping sounders, I'm not going to put the trap up where the biggest sounder shows up first. I'm going to put the trap up where the biggest sounder shows up last because the obviously the beauty of the pig brig is we don't have a catch gate and they keep coming in. The, the situation is with pig behavior, if you put the trap up where the biggest sounder comes in first, you may catch that biggest sounder, but those sounders that are, are less dominant comes by later and they see that the bad guys are in the trap already, there's not much chance they're going to go in. Whereas if you flip the script, and you go in there and you catch that smallest sounder first where the big sounder comes in last, those big sounder comes by and they see the little guys in the trap already. And then it becomes a territorial issue and they're going to try to treat them, teach them a lesson. So you got a, a, a higher likelihood at multi sounder catches. If you pay attention to how your sounders overlap, I know that's a long drawn out answer, but the, I guess the final part of that is in that, that, that question is how far apart would I put those traps I would not put a trap any closer than a quarter of a mile for any reason. Okay. That just, uh, those animals can cover a quarter of a mile in extremely quick period of time. The only reason I would try to change if I would have them anywhere between a quarter and a half a mile apart is depending on where the bedding areas were and how the wind flow was and how that wind would dis, uh, disseminate the smell of that bait across that landscape. So never closer than a quarter of a mile, but uh, I would like to try to stay half a mile or more. Excellent question, though. Our property has no nearby agriculture, surrounded by natural forests or national forests. What ugh, will the natural green up still reduce the bait effectiveness? Yes, it will. And what we'll see is in those in those standard timber stands like that, like you're talking about, is you're still going to have that 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 understory that's going to be of green briar and different things that are going to pop up. You're going to have your another thing that it may not be your your typical green up that we would see with forbs or whatnot like that. But in your timber stands, you may have muscadine grapes. You may have other things that are in that mid story, and that is still a highly sought after uh, nutrition. And, and it doesn't mean that it has to be a foot off the ground. It can still be 30 foot off the ground and still have that attracting ability. But the, but you, and then and, and again, too, in those, those timber settings and those timber environments, we won't see as prolonged of a period that pigs don't respond to bait, but we will see a shorter period. I mean, it, it will be a period. So whereas in the spring of the year, in, in more open areas, it's got much more of an agriculture base or a forb base, we may see that leverage. Um, not being what we want it to be for a couple of months. We're in a in a timbered environment. It may be less than a month. So it's just a matter of what how thick that canopy is, how much sunlight gets to the floor of that canopy, what other species are there. But you, no matter the setting, you're going to see some loss of bait leverage in the spring of the year. I know that month that you're waiting feels like forever. Um, no doubt. Yes. Speaking of some spring cleaning, we have a question. One of my traps has been underwater for a year. I could take one guess where they are. It is about side deep right. in water and mud right now. What do you think the condition of the net will be? Do you think that the material of the net will survive these conditions? Worst case scenario, they might have to get a new one. Well, see, and I, and I and if I was to 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 put my money on this bet, you're you're in probably in Louisiana because I think after the the winter that you've had in Louisiana, the 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 Gulf of Mexico extended all the way to Monroe. So that's something that that uh, water is an issue in 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 much of that part of the state of the country. Um, what I would say in regard to the the trap, if it's been underwater that long, one is to to get it out to inspect it to make sure that other things didn't happen along the way. Because if it was in water that was that deep, was there anything that could have drifted in it that would have ripped the skirting and the material and, and so forth? So the other thing is is that that um, we have making sure that you you remember that we do have the UV 
coating on there, the UV protections on there. Uh, the material that makes up that netting is very abrasive. It's very or abrasive resistant. It's very uh, hardy. And we have a pretty high confidence rating that that that, that net's going to be there for you. What I would definitely check to see, though, is before you put it out, is to, to go out there. Once you get that net out and looked at and, and dried and all, uh, put some weight on it. Press on it a little bit. Make sure that it, it's it's uh, it's not going to have any any flaws in it that you can't see. But the short answer is I wouldn't hesitate. I'd put that net right back out there and put it under under work and, and make it earn its keep. Um, so if it's had the winter off underwater, it needs to get back to work. Anything else? Just like every week, folks, these are good questions. We like to get them. Uh, the last question we had is a little, um, little more broad. Let's say, have you regarding fish and using fish? Have you done any experiments using invasive Asian carp? No, I have not. I, where I'm at in in uh, in Texas, uh, we luckily do not have that problem with invasive carp yet. Uh, that's a uh, that's one of those problems we hope we never see. But it's almost just like the encroachment of pigs. It's only a matter of time, I think. Unfortunately. Um, but but that would be a situation again too with like using those fish carcasses. I think it doesn't really doesn't really matter the species of the fish. It's just going to be the fact that it's going to be something new. And uh, yeah, you'll get some response because of the curiosity of a new bait. But we have to keep in mind that that um, using those types of baits, you're going to attract so many more non-targets that it's just going to be a, a concern that you'll have to weigh out and see if it's worth the risk or worth the inclusion. Does playing sounds of pigs help to attract pigs to a trout? If what is it again, Marshall? Does playing sounds of pigs help to attract pigs into well, a trout? And 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 if you'd asked me this five years ago, I'd have said absolutely not. But um, what we're seeing with the with the pig brig is quickly, quickly changing my mind. And what I mean by quickly changing my mind, it's not something that like I'm going to set out a game caller and call in pigs to a trap location. But what we're seeing all over the world is that when we're conditioning pigs, we may only see that we've got 10 pigs coming to a trap location when we activate that net and get ready to catch. But then we show up the next morning to get pigs out of that trap and we've got 18 or 20. So it's like, where did we come up with double the number of pigs when we were confident in what we had coming was only half that? And very uh, and a very easy uh, assessment of what happened there is that if you're out around pigs and you're listening to them, whenever they're in an active feeding pattern, they have a language just just like we would if we were in a different setting. So my my opinion of that is quickly shifting to the focus that whenever you have feeding pigs and the sound of feeding pigs, it's going to attract other pigs that's in the area because a pig is a glutton unless you get right down to it. They don't want any other pig to have something that they can't have. So the sound of feeding pigs in a pig brig very commonly attracts pigs that may have never even shown up during a conditioning phase. So that's something, again, too, that's a testament to the brig is that whenever those pigs are caught in that pig brig, they don't even know it that they've been caught because they're still in an active feeding pattern. So that 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 sound that's there, I don't know so much that playing a sound to attract pigs before pigs are actually in a trap is going to do you any good. Um, but we have seen it in increasing frequency that pigs that are already caught we end up seeing a lot more in the trap the next morning that we never had a clue that we were going to catch. And there's no doubt it's because of vocalization. It falls back to your dominant thing. At right. Yes. So, and I, I think, I mean, that's an exceptionally good question. And, and, and that's something that what we would like for y'all to start watching too, is whenever you get pigs caught in your traps, start watching the behavior of those pigs in the trap and, and seeing how many pigs you had at conditioning versus how many pigs you had whenever you get there to take those pigs out the next morning. Uh, that just, uh, it, it continues to solidify the fact that, that the calmness of the pigs feeding in a pig brig will actually attract other pigs. Anything else? Everything. That's uh, I think that's, that's all it. of it, man, folks. Y'all made it. Y'all made it easy tonight. We're actually five oh, minutes till eight. Uh oh, here we go. What do we got? Where I live, 
there is a high black bear population and it's hard to deter bears from traps and our baiting ways, what would be your suggestion? Well, that's a, that's something that's a, a good question that, that you to bring up is that bear situation is continuing to be an escalating situation across the country. Uh, one of the things that I've been actively involved in now for probably eight or nine months is looking for bear repellents to use at trap sites just for that simple fact. Uh, once you're starting to, to trap or to condition pigs and a bear shows up and actively feeds, you're going to lose those pigs. So we started off about 10 months or so ago, looking at about 35 different uh, repellents to use on, on uh, bears and not lose the ability to catch pigs. And now we're down to about two or three options that are really, really promising for us. So we're, we're still wanting to make sure that we get some exceptional data that we can stand behind regardless of the time of the year. And we're not quite there yet, but uh, if you've got that question and you want to give it a shot, give me or Marshall a call. Call us on the pig brig number. Uh, if I'm giving this number wrong, please correct me, Marshall, but 833-744-2744. So 833-744-2744. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what you may have there because we've got uh, a couple of different, like I said, maybe two or three different things that look very, very promising. And one one option may be better suited for you than than others so um until we get something nailed down concrete then we don't want to, to tell you this is what's going to be the the silver bullet for bear removal at a trap site until we get a chance to talk to you a little bit more uh, uh specifically about your setting but it will happen very very soon folks that's definitely uh very close to the to the horizon of, of letting that cat out of the bag Anything else? I see the number on the chat started peaking just a little bit. Uh, anybody else have any more questions? Going once, going twice. That's all, folks. That's it. Oh, all wait, right, wait, folks. Wait. Well, uh, Bears will most likely damage the trap. They destroy my feeders for sure. Well, and that's what whenever we have those bears come into that trap, if it's in a conditioning phase, that's typically when we're going to see bears showing up. Because if you condition those pigs, it's going to be typically conditioned longer than it's going to be set. So what we're going to do if we have bears in the, in the, in the area is, is be proactive instead of reactive and, and start out with some of that bear deterrent uh, options during the conditioning phase. That way we keep those bears pushed back no matter what. Um, so now we can't do a whole heck of a lot about it. If you catch pigs and a bear comes along and he wants a pork steak, then that's just a different setting, but to keep those pet, those bears back quick, uh, long enough to get those pigs caught. We, we, we can do something about that. Anything else? Yeah. To add on that, uh, I think I'm the only one that's had any major damage to their trap from a bear. Um, most times they can, if they push under, they climb over the top uh, with, with very little issues um, when that trap's in catch mode. Yeah, bears definitely look for the path of least resistance just like pigs do most of the time. Anything else? Is putting a feeder better than pouring out of a bag that's going to depend on where you live i mean if you have to use a, a feeder to condition pigs because you live remotely then yeah we need to make sure those pigs are conditioned the right way and that's going to be consistency so if you need to have consistency because of where you possibly live and and uh, with regard to trap location yeah a feeder needs to be used the only thing that i would draw your attention to with regard to using a feeder is that Whenever you transition from conditioning to the set of the trap, we need to make sure that the bait that's being deployed out of that feeder is all uh, collected within the confines of the trap itself. We don't want any bait to be deployed out of that feeder getting into the skirt of the net uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that if that bait is deployed into the skirt of that net laying on the ground, pigs may be hesitant of going in because they don't have to commit to the bait on the inside. 
So if they're feeding as they're pushing under that net and something spooks them, they're going to back out. Whereas if that bait is on the inside of that trap, they're going to have to commit to that bait and lessens your chances of losing those pigs if something spooks them in the in the in the the meantime. The other situation of may of keeping bait out of the skirt of that net is going to re, be regarding uh, antlered bucks. Uh, whenever we have whitetail deer that have hard antlers, uh, we want to make sure that that bait is out of the skirting of that net. And the reason for that is if that bait is in the skirting of that net and those deer start to try to feed into that net, that left to right sweeping motion of their head, picking up that bait that's that's in the, 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 the uh, skirting material itself is gonna increase your possibilities of deer getting their antlers hung. So if you're using feeders, you need to use them appropriately. Uh, but as far as being able to specifically dictate the, the abundance of corn or the right amount in the right location, uh, nothing's gonna beat putting it out by hand. And with a feeder, uh, when you go to put that trap in catch mode, you're going to want to take a bag of corn with you um, to have enough bait in the trap uh, on uh, when you go into catch mode. You want about uh, four to five pounds per pig. Yeah, and that's what you're seeing on the at, during the conditioning phase. So, and typically your your spin feeders that you're using for deer hunting is not going to be able to give you that volume of feed that you need to catch. Not so much a big issue during conditioning, but it is at set. If a neighbor, if a neighboring farm has a pig problem but is doing nothing to deal with it, what could I say to convince them to use the pig brig system? Well, one of the things about land ownership is that you can do basically what you want to, and it doesn't matter what your neighbors think. So that's going to be a challenge of, and, and we see that challenge everywhere with land fragmentation being an increasing problem. Um, the, the thing is, is basically to, to not tell them what they're doing wrong, um, because the more you push somebody in a negative way, the more they're going to dig their heels in and not do anything at all. Uh, so if you're trying to convince somebody that, um, that, that may not be doing anything on their property, basically it's just going to be telling them your success stories. How many quail poults you're seeing or, or quail chicks you're seeing? How many turkey poults is out there? How many does you see with twin fawns that are out there on your property? And, and, and you need to um, make sure that they're aware of the positive uh, impacts that you're seeing or the positive responses that you're seeing from pig management. Um, if they're not, you are to, to give them benefits of the pig brig itself is many of the times those absentee landowners or landowners that are reluctant to manage their property is concerned about animal welfare of the pig. And, and, and there's validity in that is that whenever we catch that pig, we're still a steward of the land and it's our responsibility to manage those pigs in an ethical manner. So a lot of times we see pig, people reluctant to manage pigs because if they're using a metal sided or prefab panel trap, uh, those pigs injure themselves quite frequently from beating up on the side of that trap. Uh, whereas opposed to a pig brig, uh, you got pigs out there in that, that trap that are caught. Many times they don't even realize they're caught until they're ready to leave. But if they get ready to leave, they, they hit that net and it's basically like bouncing on a trampoline. So whenever you're thinking about animal welfare, there's no harm to those animals. And, uh, and, and the ethical side of things is at the utmost uh, importance. But it's going to depend on the individual landowner. What I would suggest is that get to know your adjacent landowner really, really well and what what drives their boat, basically. What are their hot button issues? What do they respond to? And use what their interests are to, to convince them to, to, to incorporate some level of pig management. And if they're not willing to incorporate pig management, will they allow you to go on their property to incorporate it? Good question. We get that question all over the planet. Well, that was great. Thank you guys so much. I think that's about all the questions. That's all. Okay, folks, I hope we, we see you again, hear from you again in April. So it'll be the 27th again, uh, 7 p.m. Central. And um, and again, if there's anything we need to address at that event that you know ahead of time, send us that, that email or give us a call and let us know. We'll make sure it happens. Appreciate it, folks. Y'all have a good night. Be safe and enjoy your spring.